is a hushed afternoon on Thanksgiving 2014, and the cool wind somehow brings the scent of holidays through the open windows. I, I take a deep breath and quickly run towards, and quickly run through my speech in my head just as someone raps their fist on the front door, brash and impatient. I open the door to Mark Twain. Mark Twain. And I watch his mustache move as his lips fiddle with a fat cigar in his mouth. Twain briefly shakes my hand before slipping past me and moving towards the kitchen. I catch him before he gets too far, ask him to put the cigar out, and redirect him to the dining room, and wait for him and tell him to wait for the others. I note that he seems to be in high spirits, though my mission for this gathering is to persuade him and two others to let my American literature professor continue using their words from his class. I note that he seems to be in high... I note Twain, being the humorist, is probably disparaging me in his head as a way to mask the distaste. Though I do not know why they would request their works to be removed from the class, I am confident that I will succeed in my mission. As I ponder Twain's unexpected cheer, uh, the door is tapped once more. This time, it is a series of three knocks that are more forgiving and calculated. I open the door to Emily Dickinson, who smiles timidly as she hands me flowers she says is from her own garden. She compliments the smell of my food before I'm able to invite her inside. I note that the flowers smell delightful and that I'm psyching myself out. I have, my, I have the meals ready and the beverages poured. When my final guest arrives, there is a single knock that rings out for a bit, and I open the door for Sylvia Plath. She kisses me once on each cheek, addresses me as darling, and courteously asks if she may come in while she delicately steps past me. Plath observes the space around her, nodding at the art on my walls, and then greets Twain and Dickinson as though they were old friends. I take one last deep breath, soaking up the vibrant scents in the kitchen, before I stop, before I serve one, each one their individual meal. As I have rehearsed dozens of times, I casually begin my spiel. Hello, and welcome to, to each of you. I want to first properly thank you all for being here, for your incredible works, and for joining me this Thanksgiving. I know it was a journey for all of you, seeing as you all had to be resurrected and whatnot. Um, but I sincerely appreciate your efforts. I have gathered you here today so I may persuade you to allow my American literature professor to continue using your works in his class. For this occasion, I wanted each of you to feel special and so treasured, hence the different meals and reasons I will provide as support of my argument. The flow of my speech is automatic at this point, so I just continue and address my first guest, Mark Twain. Mark Twain. <sighs> Mr. Twain, I made you a hearty meal of hot biscuits and smothered with smothered with homemade butter, served with pancakes or um, hot cakes, a thick steak, and a cup of coffee. This meal represents the American West in which you lived and provides complete nutrition and heart healthy cholesterol. Um, Mr. Twain, please call me Sam. Okay, Sam, you are a par you are the paragon of American literature. You practically wrote the book on the classic American novel. Well, actually, you wrote a few. Your stories have withstood time because of your humorous and conversational writing style. Your words make the reader feel welcome and allow and allows us to enjoy the content of the story without being distracted by fancy Victorian terms. And you have the brilliant ability to write unique characters without making them feel fictional. Hey, hey. For example, in your story, The Celebrated Jumping Frog of Calaveras County, we are told the tale of Jim Smiley, the man whose willingness to gamble on literally anything makes, made, made readers laugh out loud. I'm sure that man would have bet on what color the pillows are on my couch are. A grown man betting on the color of pillows in a stranger's house seems laughable, but with a man like Jim Smiley, it's more than plausible. This tale also reminded readers that street smarts are just as important as book smarts, proven when the narrator shares his suspicions that his friend is sending him to accomplish a fake favor. This is just one example we actually used in the course, but you have so many other works that are so invaluable. Several times your novels have been banned from being taught in schools, but each time they are brought back because, of, because you provide such an authentic voice on what life was like in Victorian America. Your frequent use of the N-word in Huckleberry Finn creates conversation about racism and prejudice in classrooms. 
and the dialogue you provide is so, so relevant and important. Please do not censor yourself from my class. Please allow Professor Mitzis to continue teaching your story. His eyes shine bright with tears as he smiles and nods his approval. Thank you. I turn to my second guest, Emily Dickinson. Emily Dickinson. Who also seemed moved by my words. Miss Emily Dickinson, what a pleasure it is to have your presence in my home. I present you with a salad made entirely from things in my own garden, as a nod to your personal garden. I also present to you a slice of bread and a small glass of red wine to symbolize the religious themes in your poems. Miss Dickinson, please, my friends call me M. Wow, okay. Um, M, uh, your poems have a distinct, complex voice about them, something entirely to your own works. Your dedication to reporting on society causes the reader to observe every day, every aspect of life, and to truly question the meaning of our lives. I love how you leave your poems open-ended, where there is no clear resolution and the reader is left to determine what happens next. I love that you use your unique voice to capture our attentions and then to plant questions and doubts into our minds, and to make us ponder life's mysteries and little things. One of my favorite poems that we covered in my favorite class was I Heard a Fly Buzz, also known as Poem 465 in my textbook. Um, there are so many different interpretations of it, furthering the conversation. Some feel the fly is a bad omen, but I feel it is just commentary on how even the most significant points of life, such as death, are only significant to ourselves, and that the world does not stop doing ordinary things when something tremendous is on the verge of happening. I particularly love your choice of words because they are odd and call out for more attention. Another poem I read of yours was Because I Could Not Stop for Death, also known as Poem 712 in my textbook. Again, this poem plays with the themes of immortality and life simultaneously. I appreciate the symbolism, how the carriage is your life, and that it pauses in front of the school, a field, and then lingers at the speaker's house to symbolize how brief life is. Not only is your word choice unusual, but your actual writing style is equally intriguing. You utilize a punctuation style all to your own, and you own it. Another reason your work needs to continue being a part of my professor's course is due to your gender. Female poets, writers, etc. were not appreciated back in the 19th century, but you inspired other women to write down their words as well. You provide a key outlet for women in the history of America, which is something all students need to recognize. Women did not get the respect for their works that they deserved when they lived, so it is vital to give their words re their, that respect now. Even though you often discuss deep themes such as death, nature, religion, love, and others, your poems are timelessly written and can be interpreted by all ages. Please continue your legacy and the legacy of other female trailblazers and allow Professor Mitzis to continue using your poems in his class. M is openly weeping now for... I suppose. She's never had someone speak so highly of her works during her, her own lifetime. She grips my hand and smiles while nodding her head and wiping her, te and her, her tears. Thank you. I move down to my third guest, Sylvia Plath. Sylvia Plath. Who is not yet crying, but sniffles quietly. She gives me a slight nod, and I continue with my argument. Miss Plath, I am pleased to serve you my grandmother's favorite delicacy, a peanut butter and banana sandwich with thick spiced bacon in the middle and rich golden honey drizzled in between. I know you have a fondness for rich foods, and this particular sandwich makes one feel like a millionaire. Miss Plath, you may call me Sylvia. Oh, okay. Sylvia, um, like Miss Dickinson, you have questioned the society around you and took pride in being unique. In a culture where we're getting married, having kids, and living as a housewife was the main goal for women, you focused on your writings and pursued your education. Your poems are so personal, almost like you are confessing your secrets to the reader, and provide a voice for women of all ages today. I. You called, out Amer you called American society out on being so incredibly gender-biased and on behalf of women everywhere. I thank you for that voice, because not every woman, because so few women were given the means to do so. Not only do you highlight the injustices of society, but you also bring such awareness to suicide and mental illness. 
One of my favorite poems, and one that is, was used by, in my American literature course, was entitled Lady Lazarus. And in this poem, you describe your third suicide attempt with such elegance and poignancy. Your words haunt me to this day. I love that you mock those who gawk at the sight of your scars. I believe you say, the peanut-crunching crowd shoves in to see. Them unwrap me hand and foot, the big strip te tease. Your ability to find some dark, humorous twist somehow lightens up the event of suicide. It allows the reader to chuckle under their breath for a moment before furthermore following your words. Attempted suicide and the idea of death is a touchy subject, something rarely spoken of. But you handle it bravely and boldly by offering symbolic wisdom of your personal history with it. You make the readers feel comfortable and safe, again, like you are sharing secrets with us. You make the... Your dedication to giving your, po your poems an intimate voice resonates with readers today and is what made you one of my literary heroes. I, I hope you will allow Professor Mitzes to continue making students aware of your immensely courageous voice. Again, thank you so much. I am beginning to tear up when I say those last words, but Sylvia gets up to hug me and congratulates me for my, bra my bravery. As Miss Plath returns to her seat, I turn to address them as a group. I am sure that each of you had your reasons for asking Professor Mitzes to pull your works from his class, but I hope my arguments tonight will change your mind. Sam, you represent so many facets of what life was like in America during the 19th century, and your pieces are still relevant and relatable today. M, you represent women during the 19th century and continue to inspire and amaze people of all sorts to this day. And Sylvia. You represent, you represent the feminist movement of mid-century America, and your bravery and boldness have changed lives and brought awareness to sexism and mental illness. All of you have written pieces with authentic voices that allow readers to immerse themselves into your worlds and to question the, uh, the society around us. You are my literary heroes, and I know so many people have been moved by your words, and many more will continue to be inspired. Thank you for joining me. They all move to hug me and thank me, saying how pleased they are with my efforts and that they appreciate my words so much. It seems I have accomplished my mission and persuaded them to allow Professor Mitzes to continue the, to use their works during next semester.